Hello, and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, the day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today we are joined by Britt, I forgot, is it Garner? Yeah. Not Gardner. No D. Okay, just making sure. Uh, who is the new host of SciShow Psychology, along with me? Hey, thanks for doing that. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, it's going well. How do you like it? I know this is what we're supposed to be talking about. Okay, well, between you and me <laughs> and everyone, yeah. um, it's awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy to be involved with this. My um, my mom's PhD is in psychology, and so even though I don't study it directly, mm -hmm. it's so near and dear to my heart, and yeah. I follow it just uh, in terms of like pop science and what's going on. So. Yeah, and I love like getting the scripts in my inbox and I being know. like, what fascinating thing am I going to learn about my brain today? Totally. But you are also a scientist. Yes. Um, and so we're going to talk about the science that you do right now. Awesome. You're at the university right now here mm -hmm. in Missoula. Yep. And you're studying animals. In just animals. In a degree in animals. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to look good on the paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. PhD in, in animal. animals. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, so you've studied a bunch of animals, and you, yes. well, I, I mean, it is like you're studying all kinds of weird stuff, like vertebrates mostly, but like that's broad. <laughs> well, some have said. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in a bunch of different ways, and kind of in new ways. Mm, so mm -hmm. kind of con conservation stuff, but in with like hard science. Yeah. Uh, figuring out. It's a kind of a hard nut to crack, especially when you start thinking about it globally. How do we figure out what, like, what these animals are doing without like going in and like tagging every single one right. and being like, "How often do you die? Who do you have sex with? Where do you go?" We actually just asked them that on surveys. It's great for data collection. <laughs> yeah, like, Hi, yes. What was your recent sexual partner? Um, <laughs> yes, and know. did you die yesterday? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> Biology is easy. It's super easy. Super easy. <laughs> Um, so, so what what animals are you studying right now? Yeah, There's two two main things, right? Yeah, two main things. So, um, my background is in conservation genetics, now genomics, because we have the possibility of opening up to so much more data. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is focused on climate change and salmonids, so trout and salmon out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so you're sort of using genetics to find out things about the populations. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, that'd be pretty much a baseline definition of conservation genetics, right? Mm -hmm. So I, my bachelor's was zoology, and I, I just love animals, right? So many of us, that's, that's the cool thing about kids is they're pretty much fearless when it comes to animals. They learn to be scared of things, but I mean, there's just this, yeah. this attraction. And mm -hmm. for some of us, we never lose it. Yeah. I am one of those people. <laughs> and the thing is though, I, I'm crazy about math, crazy about science, and really fell in love with genetics uh, early on. And I didn't know that those two could go together, and then I found that they could. Yeah. Um, and I jumped in head first and then wound up doing work in it, yeah. So it's using um, uh, molecular data from molecular analyses, so on genetics or genomics, so mm -hmm. using a ton of genes, genome-wide, um, yeah, to uncover uh, the story, pieces of the story about populations, usually ones that are in danger or mm -hmm. potentially going to be. And what's, what's kind of the story that you're, that you're helping figure out? Yeah, so right now there's incredible research going on uh, with landscape um, genomics and connectivity, and we're actually combining for the first time, um, or one of the first times, people right now, uh, the idea of remotely sensed variables. So we have all this amazing uh, satellite capability mm -hmm. and, these, and these sensors that are collecting data at a mind-blowing rate and resolution. Uh, but they're about things that are abiotic, so non-living. So what we're doing is combining those abiotic, remotely sensed environmental variables, so things like variables, variables, things like uh, precipitation, temperature, so mm -hmm. ice melting, the, you know, uh, plant composition in terms of actual coverage, you know, mm -hmm. not species. And then combine that with genetic data or genomic data, depending on what What's it is. What's the difference between those two things? Because I don't even, I have no idea. Oh my gosh, what an exciting question. I was just baiting you, hoping you'd ask. <laughs> Um, well, it's just such a caveat because some of our work is genomics, and so it's like conservation genetics or genomics. So um, the genome is every piece of DNA in your yeah. body, right? This is, makes up the whole thing. A gene is a stretch of DNA that has a job. That's right. you know a basic way of saying it. So when you do a genetic analysis, you're looking at a bunch of genes. So imagine mm -hmm. we've got you know yeah, snapshot yeah, just, here, snapshot here. Mm -hmm. Now to do a genomic study. This is contentious because it's like, well, how many is genomics, right? And we're figuring right. that out. We don't have these like set ceilings, but you can think of it as 
not only weigh more markers, like complete genome-wide coverage, right. but being able to also see the interactions. So potentially not just this location, but how does this one right next to it affect it, which mm -hmm. affects this, which is here and here. Yeah. Um, so when we say genomic, it's just the scale of, of the study yeah. and also the, the questions that you can answer. Yeah. Um, only some you can do with genome level versus genetic level. And so is this in, in some ways like the like in the way that we would in the past like stick up antenna into a fish and like track it going around, you can sort of say like, well, this fish, like the, this population of fish are all related and they have, and then over time you can see new uh, genetic information coming into that population, which means that it's, that there's some intermixing with other populations or stuff like that? Yeah, so you actually uh, just listed two of, um, of some of the most like basic and direct applications of conservation uh, genetics or genomics, which is um, how closely related are they? Mm -hmm. Okay, so doing either pedigree reconstructions and um, very easily too. I mean, imagine trying to figure that out yeah. without. Yeah, without. I mean, <laughs> you don't. You'd have to sit there yeah. and record yeah. who yeah. screws whom and well, who you gets even, pregnant. You can't even figure that out right. with people. Like, I mean, like going look, back yeah. very many generations with humans. We have Mori Povich. I mean, like we couldn't yeah. even do it on our own, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so clearly, yeah, the the, the critters not so much. Um, although I would I would pay to watch that for sure. Um, yeah, so, so certainly who is re related to whom, and then that it tells us about um, the inbreeding level in a population. Now, mm -hmm. why does that matter? Because genetic diversity is the key to moving forward. Mm -hmm. So what's awesome about studying biodiversity on the genetic level is that instead of saying, here's where we are, we're saying, here's the evolutionary potential. Mm -hmm. Here's where this, here is where this population can go, and maybe how long it will take. And why it might be threatened by habitat fragmentation versus climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have going on with the trout and salmon out here is um, they are incredibly, incredibly uh, ectothermic and sensitive. So they rely on their environment for their temperature, like a lot of fish. But mm -hmm. um, they have requirements that are, are very, very specific, and they're incredibly sensitive. Yeah, so, so the rivers get a little warm out here, and then the... Yeah. Trout populations just crash. Right, yeah, the, yeah. so they are, are not resilient to these changes, and the whole thing, you know, with climate, quote, change, it's all about how fast. It's all about rate, and which mm -hmm. is what we all have to remind ourselves. How quickly can mm -hmm. these guys, you mm -hmm. know, get with it through natural selection or through any form of mechanism, right, genetic drift, gene flow, all these things, um, versus the actual changes that are occurring. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of have an, an awesome opportunity for this canary in the coal mine, you know, climate mm -hmm. change kind of flag with these salmon and trout populations out here. Um, so we can overlay that remotely sensed environmental data with the genetic data over a time series and see what's correlated, right. what's affecting what. And so then, how much yeah. data do you get? Like how much, like do you go out and like, or does someone go out and just poke a bunch of fish? Yeah, just, I mean, that's, that's it. Just let they go Conservation by. genetics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what we have uh, in, in a lot of the streams is um, really tiny uh, fin clipping. So just taking the tiniest bit of tissue off of. And do you catch the fish? Like you go fish? Yeah, so it's, a, uh, yeah, electrofishing. So not fishing, but electro okay. electrofishing actually out in, in Glacier, yeah, which is um, a really fun way to spend your summer interns. <laughs> <It's like laughs> Come on out. Is the electrocuting fish? Very lightly. <laughs> it's, it's very lightly. Mild electrocution. Just the tiniest just bit for them to pause to then to then oh, net clip oh, okay. and back. So, so you don't just, like you don't like uh, it's not like you throw some like a like an M eighty under there and they just all float at the top. Now I'll suggest that for next time, <laughs> next field season. Yeah. No, it's a uh, it's it's awesome actually. You kind of look like Ghostbusters. Like you got this backpack and and you're going and just uh, tasing fish. Yeah, just it's a tiny like uh, it's a kind of. Tiny electric net that you just put underneath and then goes. I totally did not make the connection. Here's a SciShow Psych episode. Me electrocuting the hell out of myself because not thinking about electricity going through water oh, um, nice. as I reach down to adjust my uh, my waders. So you know, <laughs> but apparently that's initiation. Yeah, yeah, you'll get it. Yeah, cool. I mean, my thought was maybe that you just had fishermen do it because they're catching fish all the time. Yeah. So the interesting thing about that and is kind of this idea of citizen science, which yeah. we also Just like do, have a little Ziploc bag full of right? tiny fin pieces. Right. Did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Here's, the, here's your 50 cents. <laughs> yeah. Much appreciated. Yes, it's like a can drive. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, 
Yes, yes and no. So to be able to do that, you really want to, again, make sure that the veracity of your data is, is good. You've got, you know that they knew what species this was, mm -hmm. where they got it, right? Right, right. So there's a little bit of iffiness, but if you are training citizens and you are making, so mm -hmm. like I make um, training videos for the bio station for people who go and collect um, environmental DNA samples, um, which we can totally talk about, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, you know, we say, here are all the steps, we're giving you the equipment. But the other thing about DNA is that it's sensitive. So I am, um, I have a, a great friend who does paleontology, right? And I'll, and I'll go out and, um, and help him during the summers and things. And you know, come across something and I'm like, nobody touch it. <laughs> like, yeah. And then it's like, you know, they're just like, I do paleontology, I'm just gonna, I can lick my hand and put it on. You know, but with, with, yeah. with DNA, it's just, you can have contamination very easily. So where cells and DNA well, can come from. But that from. is a thing with like, uh, with archeology, span because yes. they want to do genetic testing on this stuff. Right. And if you like find an arrowhead and the first thing some people who are collecting this stuff do is they'll lick it so that they can get a better yeah. look at what the rock is. Yeah. So just like shine it up a little bit and then you put human DNA on it. Well, yeah, exactly. And like in human versus fish, I mean, that signal's pretty easy to parse right. out. Yeah. But if you're doing an anthropology study, human versus human, uh, yeah, not, not you so know, not easy. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but fish versus fish can be, I imagine, a little harder. Yes, and, and, and there are definite examples of people thinking they found some crazy result and like being on the verge of publishing oh. it and then being like, that, that was contamination. That was totally contamination. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and it and it happens. Um, the other fun thing I used to work on uh, ancient DNA, so DNA that's very degraded and really really sensitive, um, of sea lions uh, and fur seals. This was during my masters, and I uh, I have cats An at the ancient house. Ancient sea lions and fur seals. Yeah. So like not that not that they were old and then I got their DNA, but okay. that uh, they died uh, between like four to seven thousand years ago. Where did you so, get their DNA from? So this is on Kodiak Island, so from bones. So I actually like right. got into the bones and, nice. and like took stuff out. That's yeah, um, super sweet. The how far back we can go if it's preserved in the right in the right, right uh, place. But the thing is with contamination, sea lions and uh, and fur seals are close enough, uh, closely enough related to to cats that my orange tabby um, <laughs> may or may not have uh, have wrecked uh, a nice one of our panels, <laughs> except the other guy in my lab had an orange tabby too, so I was like, it was him. It was definitely <laughs> his cat. It was definitely some kind of orange cat, but it was definitely <laughs> well, not mine. Orange didn't come up in the reading, but no. we knew. <laughs> <laughs> Good tell. So yeah, Good contamination is, is one of those things, yeah. So um, our, so just just note, yeah. we're not gonna get to your other research, so maybe we should just talk about it next time you come on the show. Because I'm too interested in this. You guys are just going to be a next time. This is very exciting. May, I mean, I, it's like we always like to have. It's so fun. Yeah. There's yeah. so much to say about this this yeah. topic. So, uh, so have you have you gotten any good trout data? How are they doing? How are the fishies? <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine that on a t-shirt and you being like, "How are the fishies, Britt? <laughs> Britt, how are the fishies? <laughs> I mean, look, it's this is a hard age to be optimistic in, right? So, it's. You know, it's not it's not that good, but the beautiful thing about life is that it's res resilient, yeah. right? And it's just how quickly, but also how quickly can we inform management policy to get mm -hmm. there? And mm -hmm. the beauty of using DNA to make decisions, so the idea of conservation genetics is we can do it for less money and faster. Mm -hmm. So to get in there and, and and have these policies implemented, you know, even at like the federal scale. So the idea of like Endangered Species Act, how things get listed, sometimes that actually comes down to genetic data. Um, as far as looking for invasive, invasive species, like we're doing that, we can detect a single cell mm -hmm. from an invasive species out in Flathead Lake and have a presence absence and know to alert, yeah. you know, release the hounds, like we, we, are, mm -hmm. we got work to do. Um, so are things good? You know, not really. We are in the middle of what is considered the sixth mass extinction, you know, and mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter, you know, how rich or poor a place is. Um, as far as human economics, I mean, the fauna are, are declining, you yeah. know? And it's just a matter of how can we be smart about um, yeah. the way we approach it. Well, I'm sorry the fishies aren't doing so good. I mean, some are. I'm sure there's some fishies just doing great. <laughs> but, uh, but it's hard. Yeah. They're, they're just, the yeah. ones out here, I mean, they're just very sensitive. And, and mm -hmm. when things change quickly, it is, it's tough. Yeah, and no, intergression was... also with uh, invasive species, too. Yeah. Well, uh, fascinating. Um, keep do, keep doing it, and I uh, want an update 
all the time. Every time I see you, you tell me how, how are the fishies? Tell me how the fishies are. <laughs> you got okay. it. All you right. betcha. Great. Well, I don't think that we're seeing a fishy, but there is an animal that's going to be coming to visit us. I'm so excited. This is her name is Kismet, oh. and she is an African crested porcupine. Now, I'm going to see if she is going to be good on the table. If she's not, I'll pick her back up and I'll just hold her for a little bit. Perfect. But I would love if she showed you how she moves. Now, she is reactive to movements, okay. um, but we'll see how comfortable she is, and you may be able to feed her. Oh, I would like that. Hi, it's gorgeous. It's a free table. You got that? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I like table. You rattle your Look little your tail. I wish, I wish my hair did that. Hi. It's very exciting. What product, product do you, you use? <laughs> oh my goodness. Is this a Stress, juvenile? cream. <laughs> um, is she is a baby. She is about five months old. Oh. These guys grow really fast. Um, they mature at, at two years old, but they're pretty much full grown at about a year. So she is, she's very small right now. My baby. Um, you got well, her. She, was, she was smaller when we got her, and then oh. now she's, she's like, Five times as big, and she's gonna get five times as big again. Very exciting. They can That's get gonna be a big two animal. to almost three feet long, and um, their quills are 24 inches long. So not only is her body like gonna be this big, but then her quills are gonna be huge. Yeah. Um, they're called African crested porcupines because of this awesome crest on top of their head, but also because when they are threatened, they will put all of their quills up and it'll look like they're wearing like a tutu of quills. It's like a peacock of, yeah. like a porcupine peacock? Yeah, and they're not, and she's a actually being cock? really, Por a, a, por a porky cock. <laughs> I think I read, I read a scientific article on that. Okay. <laughs> Peer reviewed. Yeah. She's doing really good. Would you like to give her a, a treat? Sure. Hi, sweetie. Hey, yeah. Kismet. What's this? I looked at that eye face ratio and I thought, yes. Oh, isn't that awesome? What is the little bite <laughs> tail noise? She wears her tail. So she has modified quills on the tip of her tail and they're open quills and elongated. And so when she shakes them, it makes this rattling noise. Uh -huh. And she does that when she's irritated or annoyed. And she's not doing it because she's mad right now. She's doing it because she's saying, this is my treat. And you were kind of close to me. Oh, okay. So, uh, so I'm just, I'm, she's just letting you know. Quit taking that. treats from her, and don't, please. Don't hold it too far off the table, because oh, she might. Oh, you got it. You want to go Leap. for it. Yeah. Hi, baby. There yeah, that's yours. That's so not mine, They're that's really yours. fun, because these guys are terrestrial. So they, they hang out on the ground all the time. But they have these cool feet. Uh, they have four toes in the front and five in the back. And then um, they have a little a pad on their back feet. But their front feet, they have, a, they have no thumb. But they still hold it. Oh my god. Yeah, that's like stupid cute. It's stupid cute. <laughs> that's stupid cute. And it that, is. this like this like You're doing so pure good. black adorable eyeball is so good. I know. So here you can hear her crunching. That's a good crunch. So you like numbs. <laughs> she's so she's a, a rodent, and so she has two incisors ever growing in the front, and then she has no canines in there, and then she has four molars on either side. So she's got nothing in the middle, but these nice big chompers on the front, and they will rub them together to keep them nice and sharp, so that she can eat hard foods if she needs to. Mm -hmm. um, but they also do this really interesting behavior where they will chew on rocks and bones. So these guys are cool, they're bone collectors. So they'll go out and they'll travel, they're, they're big wanderers um, in Africa, and they will just travel and travel and travel, and they will come upon dead animals, and they will gnaw on the bones, and then they'll take their bones, pick them up, and carry them back to their lair, and they build these big dens underneath dirt, and they will collect thousands just of bones bone over their layer. lifetime. Totally, totally, bone collectors. That's, what do you think? Yeah, that's a pretty badass. Yeah, and then and then you can like when you find one, you can do a bunch of genetic analysis. There you go, the there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, they can be your collectors. And yeah, can... so citizen we could, scientist uh... right here. Oh, I like yeah. it. I'll send you a video. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so she so she's getting. So, so we've got some of these coming up. Some more of them than are coming up there, yeah. And she has some that have been damaged on the sides there. So um, so she's still really awkward and getting used to things and, yeah. and figuring out like teenagers. Life. Am I right? Oh, <laughs> this little rattle is the <laughs> is like cute. way yes. too. Cute. Okay, it's super cute when she's just like mildly annoyed because of that. But like when she's mad. Does it's, it really it, go? Brrr, it's like going, and then she will take her back feet and she'll stomp her back feet. We're gonna give her a big treat right here. What do you think? Big one is a monkey biscuit. Oh, nice. I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna turn away from you. Oh, totally, always. She's like, it's mine. <laughs> so, 
All right, so the the adaptive purpose here is for warning. So does this sound yes. like something else in the like, system that well, it, it sounds so like is a it, snake? So is oh, it like mimicking? Right. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering in their habitat in the native zone, is that is it mimicking something? Yeah. I think it's kind of like a general warning yeah. for the yeah. animal kingdom. Yeah, like I think, I'm I making think the, a noise. Yeah. If yeah. anybody is gonna like somebody else might mimic that, but like this has a number of protections. All, like, I was gonna say. Hey, so, by yeah. the way, I'm so a porcupine. I don't know if you noticed, but but I just wanted you, you maybe to maybe didn't know. see all of this. By the way, yeah. right here. By the way, so yeah, she'll she'll rattle my mild, mild annoyance because I'm like I'm oh yeah see I'm like I put my hand near her while she was eating so mm -hmm. all of her quills she moved it turned that back way. toward yeah they have very so flexible sensory, right? skin so after they rattle then they will stomp their back feet and then they'll turn and all their it's cool because their skin has all these really cool muscles in them so they can like turn their quill sideways and then mm. she'll walk sideways towards a predator. Um, say it's a, like a jet, uh, leopard or a lion um, or a hyena or a human. Um, she'll encounter all those guys. Um, let's say it's a lion and uh, that lion wants to mess with her. She'll be rattling her tail, stomping her feet and she'll put those quills towards it and then if it keeps messing with her, she can sprint backwards and she's not trying to get her big quills. She's trying to get these sharp ones right mm -hmm. back here mm -hmm. and she's trying to impale them. So porcupines cannot shoot their quills and yeah. she's considered an old world porcupine, so she does not have any barbs on the tips of her quills. And actually I have some quills here to, to show you. Um, so is oh, that thanks. a modified like erector pili muscle that's doing it? Yes. Like, and, yep. Like so our goose hair bumps? and then right, that's what I'm wondering. the little muscle underneath the skin mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, so you can pull these out. So these are, this is like a typical one of those, those nice medium-sized quills, mm -hmm. and then she's got some really sharp ones right in the, in yeah, the middle here. Yeah, it's interesting. It's more so, like these big ones are like warning, show, like I have, I have yeah. uh, needles on me, but then Did like the danger ones are down below. What is that? Have, have they noted any of rattleless, if you will? So we're seeing a lot of this adaptive down with rattlesnakes here. They don't have any, baby <laughs> girl. They have some now. Um, you know, where, where the ones that have, so they're losing their rattles, basically, huh. a, a lot of rattlesnakes. rattlesnakes. Yeah, so, Cause, um, cause like, because of the roundups and things, so the yeah, ones that happen that to I'm have. a rattlesnake oh, is not a good idea anymore. There we go. Right, because we're the worst, it's, yeah. It's easier to find them than we're the get worst. rid of them. Right, so yeah, we're, we're finding it and, it, and it's extra, you know, dangerous if you're out. It's like, it's like yeah, by the way, there are snakes that uh, don't warn you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I'm right. curious how, yeah, it'd be if interesting to see if uh, they find they, that. They're least concerned. They they are, are, are a semi-invasive species in uh -huh. and themselves. So they, they, are, they do well. <laughs> they, they do, do really well. well. And um, yeah, so they've been studying these guys a lot more and, and realizing that they have just continued to expand and they're displacing the other native species of, of porcupines. And so these guys are, are really robust. And they like, uh, so they could Eat, they could kill a lion or a human um, by impaling them with their quills. What? Um, so like yeah. just infection, like over time? Oh, or like, well, they would impale them, like completely impale. So like they put you like, on a stick. You get like organ damage. Like if like yeah, like oh. this is a short one. Like she's baby. I'm gonna back up a little. <laughs> so I, I think of porcupines as like I've been given a warning, and I'm not gonna mess with that animal yeah. anymore. But you're saying like this thing could kill you. Yes. Wow. Are you gonna take this to birthday parties? Of yeah. like this like 300 yeah. pound porcupine? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I hope to do more school presentations, but yeah, yeah sure, we'll do birthday parties too. Yeah. Uh, not a three, not a 300 pound <laughs> porcupine. <laughs> just, um, I don't. Just it's like quills. I'm just picturing like a cow, but with quills. <laughs> Basically, what accurate. I expect. Accurate. That's gotta be accurate. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if there's like a prehistoric animal that was like that. Oh, there must oh. be. Oh, there that must would be. be cool for sure. Um, That'd be cool. But how but many? She's gonna get to be about 50. Okay, that's yeah. big. Um, so she's, that's she's, so she's a very big rodent. So, Let's see if we can get her to walk across. Oh. <laughs> oh. feet? She's like, this isn't my like this habitat. Floppy like, <laughs> <laughs> back leg. <laughs> I'm meant to have terrain. <laughs> this is very slippery. <laughs> It's so cute. <laughs> oh. oh man. Oh, you, you too much. What was it? These are very beefy. Like they are not. Aren't they? They're like. Strong. Yep. They are, it's, it's much more that. substantial than I would have expected. Don't break it. Don't break that. <laughs> you got a, a literal spine factory. That's, yes, but, but it's not like it's not ever. You are I mean. user <laughs> and abuser. <laughs> you are more than a factory. Each one you are is beautiful. Precious. <laughs> Don't you Don't listen to that. him? What but I guess mean? they can break can because there are a number of broken ones on yeah. there. Yeah. Pet right there. Aww. Can I give him a pet? 
was like, no. No, no I don't absolutely think so. not. I don't okay. think so. we'll, work, we'll work on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh. Yeah. I would love to see Kismet come back when Growing. with 300 pounds. Well, th- might be a while. <laughs> we want, he wants six times the max. We should max. have a reunion, uh, a reunion I, video. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I definitely want to see the progress as you yeah. become a massive uh, spine factory. Um, but very, very cute and excellent <laughs> hair. She's doing so good. Thanks a lot. Done good, yeah, kiddo. Thanks good. so That's much. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse is at Animal Wonders Montana on YouTube. Also Animal Wonders on Patreon if you want to help Pay for Kismet's food. Mm-hmm. She eats a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Snacks. Um, and Britt, you can see on youtube.com slash scishow psych along with me talking about your brain uh, and all of our brains. So thank you for, for watching. It was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.